when you hear about the work he did in the Oklahoma City bombing, and he's presiding over the investigation at the Justice Department. And the fact that he was meticulous in how he conducted that investigation. and didn't cut corners even though, in the wake of those kinds of terrorist attacks, oftentimes it's convenient. Because people aren't going to call you on it, to cut corners and at the same time. How he kept the program mourning the deceased from the memorial because he knew that each one of those people who had been killed. And each one of those families had been affected in such profound ways that tells me something about who he is. And that, as much as anything, I think is going to give me confidence that that's the kind of person we're If I'm before a judge, I want to make sure that I've got somebody who's wise and who cares about people and is not arbitrary, and can provide confidence to the justice system. And I also think part of the reason I thought Merrick was ideal now is precisely because of all the polarization we were talking about earlier. What a good moment for us to have somebody who is respected by both sides. and who Chief Justice Roberts served with on the appellate court and befriended, and consistently said despite being on the opposite. Ends of a bunch of decisions said this is somebody who If he says you're wrong, you've got to think long and hard about it. He embodies and models what it is that we want to see in our jurisprudence. Professor Strauss, let me sort of pick up on that. I mean, as you know, some people on the left were disappointed with your choice of Chief Judge Garland. They thought you should have appointed someone who would be
more aggressive in moving the court in a certain direction. And I just I guess what I want to say is, those of us who knew you back then could have said you shouldn't be surprised. Because if I remember correctly and correct me if I don't when you were teaching constitutional law. There are people in that line of work who hold up the warren. court as the model and say the court's job is to be really on the front lines of attacking societies. Problems. And if I remember correctly, you were skeptical of that when you were a law professor. So am I right in remembering that, and has the skepticism carried over? President Obama, no, no, I think you're right about this. It's an adage in con law, and you're familiar with this probably the students are. Two that the courts are a terrific shield, but they're not always a very effective sword. And what I mean by that is. is that there have been moments in history Brown v. Board of Education being the best example, and on the other end of the spectrum. A decision like Dred Scott, which was antithetical to what we want to see a court do there are certain moments where like in Brown, that democracy has broken down in a fundamental way. The majority has shut down access for the petitions for redress from a minority group. There are times where an individual who is engaging in, let's say, Highly unpopular speech is not going to be able, through the political process. To uphold the values that we, collectively, have decided are pretty important to uphold. And so, in those circumstances, I have a very progressive view of how the courts should operate.
but as I think Judge Garland said. Being a federal judge doesn't mean that you have this broad writ to simply remake society. Ideally, you've got a political process that does that, that we argue about issues, and we elect representatives. And we get votes, and we pass bills, and we get a new administration and they overturn stuff that we passed. And it's rough, and it's tumble, and it's not always elegant, but that's the constitutional design. And it has the benefit of making sure that separation of powers and decentralization. A power in our society keeps this lumbering ship moving in a pretty good direction. And so it's been rare and this is by design that the court engages in massive social engineering. Now, I care deeply about there are a whole range of progressive Causes that I will continue to fight for as long as I have a breath. I believe in a society that is doing something about climate change in an aggressive way. I believe in a society in which every child is able to get a decent education and opportunity. I believe that everybody should have health care in a Society that's wealthy it's not a privilege, it's a right. A couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was last week. I had lunch with a sampling of the people that I pardoned for nonviolent drug offenses. And I've got a woman sitting next to me who, at a very young age, in her early 20s, was sentenced to life in prison for a nonviolent drug offense. That's crazy. It makes no sense. It was unjust and counterproductive. and leaves huge scars not just in that woman's family and her children, but in our society as a whole.
so there are a whole bunch of things I've done as president and I intend to continue to do and to advocate for. Those are not things, though, that typically a Supreme Court justice is in the position to get done. They don't have taxing power. They don't necessarily have the expertise to be designing programs to get at the things that we care about. And so I do have a modesty in terms of my expectations for what the court should do. But I want the court to do what it should do really well. I want a court that does believe that equality under the law is equality under the law not just the words. but that it is operationalized, that it's real. I want a court that is treating a poor indigent criminal defendant the same as a wealthy criminal defendant. and that justice is blind with respect to she agrees with me so modesty in the scope and the nature of what the law is but doing really well what the court is designed to do that's what I'm looking for in a justice. Professor Strauss, I think we can open it up. President Obama Let's open it up to questions. There you go, a little Socratic method here. Question, hi. President Obama, hi. Question, my name is Amelia. President Obama, hey, Amelia. Question, I actually had the opportunity to ask you a question when I was 15 years old, in New Hampshire. President Obama, wow. Question, 
so I'm really happy to. President Obama, are you a student here now? Question, I am. President Obama, that's very cool. Did I answer your question the last time? Question, you did, very well. President Obama, thank goodness. All right, what do you got? Question, so I'm really happy to hear that you said you were going to continue to push for the issues that you care about. Because I, of course, believe that the push for the Supreme Court nomination is incredibly important. I'm just a little concerned that other issues could get left behind. One such issue, for example, is criminal justice reform specifically, the problem of mass incarceration. So I was wondering if you could speak to what more you'll do in your last 10 months to address this issue. President Obama, great. It's a great question. We're in this really interesting moment where generally Congress is thoroughly unproductive not. By the way, because of the members of Congress who are here who are all doing great work but in the aggregate it's not doing much. One exception has been this growing interest this movement in criminal justice reform. And it's bipartisan and it's sincere on the part of all sides on this. And it's an interest convergence. You have fiscal conservatives who have been seeing how expensive it is to incarcerate people year after year after year. And how it's breaking the bank particularly at the state level.
where if you track spending on public education and spending on incarceration over the last 25, 30 years. There is almost a direct line between more people in jail and less support for public universities, for example. So there's a fiscal concern. You've got a libertarian strand of conservatives who really believe why is it the government's business if somebody is taking smoking pot. Let's say, and why would we want to jail them for 20 years? You've got a very sincere evangelical movement that oftentimes is involved in re-entry programs or prison ministries. And so have embraced the idea of a second chance. And so you combine that with law enforcement that I think has begun to recognize that a lot of how we have. Prosecuted the war on drugs has been unproductive, and that recidivism is inevitable if people are getting no skills. They're incarcerated for decades, and then we're just releasing them with no possible support. And then the long-standing progressive view that a lot of our criminal justice system has been tainted by racial discrimination and class bias. All those things are converging. And so now we've got some really interesting coalitions. You've got the ACLU and the Cook brothers agreeing on this, which does not happen often. It would be one thing if Mitch McConnell was saying, man, it's going to take so long to schedule all the hearings and the votes. And we won't have time because we're just so busy that we can't then do criminal justice instead. But since there has been a spike in the number of days off in this Congress, and, typically, a judicial confirmation takes less than three months from the time that person is nominated Judge Alito, for example.
took 82 days this is something that shouldn't prevent us from getting done the criminal justice issues.